The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and how are you, my strong, smart friend? How are you doing? It's Judy May Murphy here. So thrilled to have so many of you from all around the world. We've got people who, goodness me, it must be the middle of the night for you. So well done for showing up live. And also a big hello for those of you who are showing up um, on the, the recording. Why are we doing this? We're doing this because you're not feeling as great as you could as often as you could be feeling great. You know that. You know that so many times these little doubts are creeping in, these little feelings of unsafety, or even just that you have felt better before or you know that there's a next level. Wherever you're at, and particularly huge, huge hugs and reassurances to people who really feel like they're so freaked out right now that they don't even know if they want to stick around, do stick around. Get in touch with me, reach out, let me know if you're in that position and we'll make sure that you get the help that you need. For most of you, the place that you're in right now is just, this is pesky and it's going on for too long. We have a little question bar, so I'd encourage you if you've got any questions or statements or high fives that you want to give um, throughout the call, please do so. Um, to start off with, can people just give me a high five? Um, just kind of raise your hand so that, aw, you guys, you're so lovely. It's a lovely mess just coming in. Um, you're, uh, yeah, if you can just raise your hand to let me know that you can hear me okay. I'm presuming that you can because you guys are saying lovely things already. Beautiful, beautiful. That is great. I'm just seeing where we've got people from. Hello. I'm not going to be able to read everything out loud um, clearly, so I'm just um, scanning as I speak because we've got we've got about 50 minutes together. It might go to the hour um, because I want to make sure that this isn't just about you feeling great today. This is about giving you new resources that you can carry on through because the worst part about not feeling great is that it closes you down for doing the things and getting you to the places that would help you to feel better, right? So it's such a, a downward spiral, a catch-22 if you like. It's like, you know, I, I could, if I could make more money, I'd feel better, but I can't make more money because I feel so bad. That's, everyone's going through a version of that. Or, you know, um, if I was in a fantastic relationship, then I'd be able to shine really brightly. And then you try a few things. You try to put a smile on your face and go out um, into the dating world, or you try this new way of bringing in more money and it doesn't help. And then that puts you into a position where you're even more scared and you start to believe that this means that it's not going to happen for you or that this means that you're somehow defective in some way or it means that you missed the boat or it means that there's all kinds of funky meanings that we give it. Because as humans, we are little meaning-making machines. We're constantly looking at, okay, this happened, what does it mean? In order that we can build a better future. But how, what happens is, these days, very often what we're doing is, we're seeing something that isn't to our taste, it's not what we want, it's not, maybe it's not what we predicted, maybe it is, but it's certainly not what we want, it's not our ideal. And then we give it the meaning that something is wrong. And certainly it feels wrong. Why does it feel wrong? Because right now your entire system is on high alert. And my guess is that if you had a tough childhood, it's probably been on high alert since then, that you're constantly scanning the horizon for is everybody in a good mood? Is everybody okay? Scanning the horizon for are there dangers here? Am I going to get hurt? And in certain situations, that needs to be. Maybe it needed to be that um, when you were a child. Certainly, you need to be on super high alert if you are out on your own in the middle of a busy city at two in the morning. There's certain reasons why that mechanism, that biological setup exists in us. It's to say, hey, 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 pay attention here, pay attention here. And what happens when that alarm is left on We become habituated to the alarm, but we stay on high alert. So we don't even realize that we're not supposed to feel this way or this isn't the way we need to feel, but we feel kind of freaked out, right? We feel sort of just, and and that might show up for you as always waking between three and four in the morning, or it might show up for you as 
um, just wanting to go, go, go all the time, not being able to rest, thinking that if you stop, then somehow your life is in danger or wanting to people please all the time, making sure that is, is everyone okay? Does everyone love me? Then I'm going to be safe. Or maybe for years, this was my favorite one. Maybe it's escaping. Maybe it's what they call um, dissociation or disassociation means the same thing that it means you're you kind of cut yourself off from your life in order that you can um, just feel better in that other world that you set up. And it might be that you're really, really good at daydreaming. It might be that you're really good at finding movies that you can completely disappear into or, you know, book series that you completely disappear into. So it's like this, this world is hurting. So I'm going to go into another world every time that happens. Now, nothing wrong with any of these things. Another way a lot of people do it is um, by getting really aggressive and kind of pushing, pushing. But to be honest, very few of those people come to me because um, I don't have that style, right? Um, in fact, I've had, to, I've had to grow that. Hopefully we'll get a little chance to talk about how do we grow the, the styles of being that are kind of underdeveloped in us so that we don't have to over rely on those styles such as flight, freeze and fawn, as we just talked about crazy activity, um, going into um, other worlds and uh, being overly pleasing to other people so that we don't have to keep using those as our go-tos in order to feel safe because after a while, they don't work anymore. So after, let's suppose that somebody um, is really into a fantasy series, um, maybe, I don't know, some manga or something, and they have a whole series and that's how they, they feel great. And when it finishes, they start watching it again, we all have our version of this, by the way, in case you're going, what's manga? Don't worry about it. It's, it's not a dessert. It should be, but it's not. Um, but the, the thing is that we all have our go-to, our way that we cope. And that needs to be our signal that we had to take better care of ourselves, and we have to take specific kind of care of ourselves. So um, I, I know that some people, the way that they uh, self-protect is by um, just denying anything, just just being like, no, that's not it. No, I'm going to do my own thing, either self-isolating or becoming like hyper independent, like not needing or wanting or relying on anybody or having to be the boss, having it to be in control of every everybody. And then when we ask, right, what could you do as well? We're not going to take it away from you because goodness knows this has worked to the extent that you've survived this long. So we're not going to take it away from you. But I am going to ask, what else? What else might be possible? So for me, I used to, when I wasn't allowed to, you know, living in a very large Irish Catholic family, growing up in a chaotic household um, where my mom was a doctor and um, part of the house was where the practice was. So the waiting room was our good living room. Um, the dining room was the office. The what we called the sunroom was mum's um, surgery. So it was it was chaotic. So I, I didn't often get to be the, be disassociated because it was just too many calls on my attention from a very young age. So I learned how to become um, a fawner. I learned how to please everybody. The patients adored me. I was so helpful to my mother. I, but at no point did I say, you know what? I can feel safer if I just say no. And it wasn't until way later in my life that I learned that I can say a quiet, controlled, well boundaried no and mean it. No, I will not be showing up to cook dinner for everybody. No, I will not be giving up my Sunday to do that for that other person. No, I will not be. And the first time you try something new in order to reassure yourself, and we've got so much we're going to be talking about, loads of different ways, what reassurance is, what works, what doesn't work, all of that. But just to know that the first few times you try something new, your body doesn't yet know that this is a safe way for you to reassure yourself. It wants to go back to the old way, the way that kept you alive up until now. So what we need to do is we need to just, you know, give it a go. We need to just say, right, let me just do that and notice that I'm actually okay. And that's the first thing I want to invite you to do right now is just notice that you're okay enough to be on this call, 
right? You're okay enough. My heart goes out to you if you have health issues right now, if you are um, in the middle of some kind of traumatic situation like a divorce or a bankruptcy or something like that. My heart absolutely goes out to you. But all we got to do is we got to start from good enough. We got to start from, you know what? We're, we're okay. <laughs> we're alive. We're here. And we can always, always build up from there. So that's the very first step is the step of presence, the step of saying, well, what's actually going on here? Because very often we are escaping into the past. We're looking at, you know, our glory days. If if you believe that your glory days are in the past, I want you to take this motto, run with it, get it tattooed on your arm or get it tattooed on, I don't know, your loved one's forehead, something, but have it in front of you all day, every day. And it says, my glory days are ahead of me. And We're not going to just live so far into the future either that we can't look after ourselves in the present. We're going to be very, very clear that we have a vision that our future can be very, very different. Now, I'm in a very privileged position for knowing this because for the last 22 years, I have been coaching people. Even as I've been appearing on big stages and appearing on TV and getting books published all around the world, as I've been doing that, I have never stopped coaching people one-to-one. And so A, it's made me a way better coach with all those years and hours, thousands and thousands of hours of experience. But also, and what that has done is it's allowed me to see in real time people having these remarkable turnarounds. You know, people who thought that because they had a certain illness that that was it for them. Um, You know, I remember one guy who um, he had a, a terminal illness He's still alive, by the way, um, 20 years later. He was one of the very first people I coached. Um, and that he um, had just lost everything financially because of that illness. And he had just got a divorce. And his new partner had just had another kid. And, his, and he just said, I can't cope. I can't do it. And he has had, so far, thus far, far um, 19 years plus of just awesomeness of just the the best life of, you know, wealth, love, Um, his, you know, his family came back together where, um, you know, he he is on great terms with his kids, like it's a blended family, it's a very healthy blended family, even has a really great relationship with his ex-wife. That's one. Um, I've helped so many people get from where you are. So think about where you are right now, where you're maybe a little bit frustrated or completely freaking out. I don't, I don't know you personally, many of you, many of you I do. Hello, hello. Um, but wherever you're at right now, I can guarantee you that there are thousands, if not millions of people who have taken themselves from your level to that place that you want to be, that place that you want to be. And certain things are required of you. So the first thing is we've got to be calm enough, right? So this whole session that we're doing is a call to calm, right? A call to calm. Usually when there's a call to something, usually when there's a rallying cry, it's to something that's a little bit more, um, how can I put it? A little bit more umphy, a little bit more like uh, bigger, louder, more passionate. And I'm asking you just to get yourself to a place where you're like, I'm okay. This is going to be okay there is time, right? And that's how we're going to be present. We're not going to try and be present by numbing ourselves out, or we're not going to try and be present by just being there in body only. We're just going to say, you know what? It's not ideal. It's not what I would have signed up for five years ago. However, I know that I'm going to be okay. So that's step one, and that's how we're going to define presence in our call to calm. The next thing then that really reassures the body, because that's really what we're doing is we're getting the body there first. Physiology first is our favorite phrase, right? Physiology first. But how do we do that? We try to think our way into it. Instead, we've got to say, you know what? Our body is the thing that is telling our brain how we're doing. That's what emotions are. Um, If you know the work of Lisa Feldman Barrett, you'll know that she's like, really, really great at describing this, that what's happening is your body is in, a, is, is in a particular state. And from that state, you're then trying to work out, okay, why is it I feel like this? And you're ascribing meaning, you're giving meaning to the way that your body feels. So let's take a really obvious example. Let's suppose you've got an upset stomach and you say to yourself, oh, that's because I just ate this, or that's because 
this person just walked into the party or that's because this always happens to me and I'm just broken and I'm right. We can make up any kind of meaning with that. But the place that we initially get our meaning, a very binary meaning of I'm okay, I'm not okay, the first place that we get that from is in our physical body. So the first part of us reassuring ourselves is doing everything that we can to let the physical body know you're okay, you're okay, I've got you, yes, this is it, we can do this, and, and sustaining that, having it that that is your norm, that is the, the way that you feel every single day, that that is your default, rather than the, you know, I'll, I'll breathe when I get home kind of feeling that so many people live with, or um, I'll, feel, I'll feel good when, I'll sit down when. Have you ever seen like a really manic hostess at a party? And all you want to do is just say, we're, we're fine. We're, we're all having a really good time here. Like, join us, join us. So let your, let your body join in with all the people who are feeling really great. We don't have a lot of evidence that there's a lot of feel good in the world right now. And that's because the people who are not feeling good are making a lot of noise. Even the ones who are saying, um, you know, you got to do this in order to feel good. Like they're not feeling good and you know it and your body knows it on a very, very primal level. But trust me, there are. There are plenty of people who are saying, I'm not actually joining in with that. I'm not actually joining in with the crazy. I, um, you know, I'm going to do what I can um, with, with what I have. And those people are actually a lot more productive when they do show up because they're more clear thinking. Um, they are um, less at sea. They are able to energetically show up in a much better way. So don't think that you are always helping yourself or others by turning toward the noise. I'd like you to, just as an experiment, for one week, turn away from the noise. And for you, that might be um, going off social media for a week or just posting and not you know, checking out other people's stuff for a week. For you, it might be um, getting other voices on board, calmer voices, more um, experienced voices in your head. Um, for you, it might be, um, you know, what is it you know already? You know already what is it that is causing noise. Here's a really handy dandy tip. Realizing that we can be bored and in need of stimulation and simultaneously be overstimulated. So you know that feeling of it's, it's too empty and it's too full at the same time. It's too much and it's too little. How does that feeling come about? Well, again, let's look at the body. So how that feeling comes about is that um, you're, you're constantly being put on high alert by the noise, by people's anger, by people's um, meanings that they're giving things, by you know something not being the way that you want it, by disasters being around, by um, disastrous predictions that people are throwing your way, by the lack of calm. And then what happens is, your, so your, your body gets to a place where it is, it is uptight. Like just check right now, like where are your shoulders right now? How is your breathing right now? How is your face? How soft is your face? I go into, I do yoga every single morning in order to get myself to that place. And I'm amazed at how um, every single morning when the teacher says, you know, and relax your face muscles. At this point, I'm, I'm taking it personally. I always think it must be about me because um, every single time I've got to relax my face muscles, I get to relax my face muscles even more. And this is how we know that there's more, there's more space within us for calm. So in this call to calm, we got to realize that we are overstimulated by things that are setting off the alarm bells and then for those of you who love the science part of it, that that then is turning on the cortisol tap, our HPA access, the feedback loop just um, stops functioning the way that it should. And yeah, so, so basically, the, long, the, the basic message is this. You got to take control of your body. You got to take control of your body really, really easy ways to do that. If you feel that it's not accessible to you to take the time even to go onto YouTube and do a restorative yoga um, session for 20 minutes in the morning, if that's not available to you, then something as simple as listening to what your own voice is doing. Is your voice harsh? 
I can always tell with a particular family member what kind of day she's had by how stringent her voice is, by how harsh her voice sounds when she picks up the phone. And she might be saying something like, yeah, I feel great. I've had a really good day. But I can tell that she is super saturated. I can tell that she is overwhelmed. I can tell that there's something going on with her. And so this is what we need to do is we need to say, how can I check in? How can I know? Because most people around you are going to be in that over heightened, over stimulated state. Another way that we do it is, and God bless Marie Kondo for this, is by um, having um, a, a place that is too cluttered, having it that you don't know where things are, having it that you, I just moved at the very last minute, I was, I was in a, a downstairs um, living room and I moved all the way upstairs to the main bedroom because I just said, you know what, I just want to feel really, really amazing doing this call, right? I don't want to see anybody going past on street level, I don't want, I just, I just want to feel amazing and the thing about just me looking around this room right now is it's astonishing how orderly and clean everything is effortlessly because I've built that practice and trust me those of you who um, have been working with me for years you know that this was a real journey for me to get to a place where uh, my external environment is ordered and that allows my internal environment to proceed in a way that isn't panicked and then it works the other way as well so it it feeds back to me so I've got this really great feedback loop going of you know calm inside calm outside calm inside calm outside having enough food right it used to be even after I had plenty of money for food I used to be really bad at stocking up on things And now there's loads of different ways that that can be done. Just taking that extra minute to just make sure that you're okay. Because there's a part of your body that if it doesn't know where the next meal is coming from, I've I've got friends who um, tour a lot. And whether that is as speakers um, or as rock stars or um, on, you know, a press tour um, as a a well-known actor. And they find that the, the one thing that makes a huge difference, if they walk into a room, and the food is good and it's there and they know that there's stuff that they can eat. That just calms them down completely. Another thing then is sound. And um, there's so much more sound in the world than we were designed for. Um, so um, some people who are more extrovert and, and like, to be, like to be stimulated, that they like to get their stimulation externally, then this advice is maybe not so much for you. But for those of us who are more introverted and are more kind of like we we like to um, use our thoughts and our imaginations and our internal dialogue to get us going. And sometimes it means then that even somebody outside of us having a conversation or noise from the street, it can be too much. So if you see me out and about, sometimes around my neck, but definitely in my bag, if you, if you ever meet me just, I don't know, wherever in New York or LA, just walking along the street, just stop me and say, Jeannie May, show me your noise cancelling headphones. I will show you not only my noise cancelling headphones, I will show you my other headphones, my, my, my earplugs, my whole range, my t- teeny tiny flare ear, earpods, my custom made earpods. Like I, I can load it up so that I can hear absolutely nothing at any time of the day or night. Um, If you were to quiz me about being able to tell the difference between um, white noise, by the way, these are just, um, it kind of sounds like, do you remember the old fashioned, for those of you who are too young to remember, um, televisions, like when you, when the television would go off at the end of the night and that was a thing, you didn't have programming all through the night and there was a kind of a hissing sound. Those have certain frequencies. I can tell the frequency difference between white noise, pink noise, brown noise, um, uh, green noise. I can tell the difference because I'm so good at using those. So self-championing is how you reassure yourself. And then specifically, the way that you self-champion is by saying, what is it that I need? What is it that I need right now in order to feel really good? Because otherwise we just do what we've always done. I used to just hear noise, get upset, get angry, go to bed. I mean, that was just my little way that I coped. And that was because that's what I knew how to do. And now I can predict that, oh, okay, I can see these people coming into this room. This is going to get noisy. Let's imagine if I'm sitting in a private club, want to get some study done, then 
I can I can predict it. I can move. I can ask a manager. Is there a room that's free? I can even like book one of the bedrooms if I really want to be completely on my own for a couple of hours. There's all kinds of things that you can do. And learned helplessness is the opposite of self-reassurance because learned helplessness says there's nothing you can do. You've just got to suffer. But reassurance says, yes, right now this isn't ideal for you. This isn't exactly what you need. And there are things that you can do. There are things that you can do immediately. And there are ways that you can reach out for support, ways that you can reach out for help. So just to remind you that there's always, always something available for you. So um, the next thing, we we talked about presence being um, a huge part um, of reassurance. And um, when we, when we are in that place of, you know, I'm, I'm here right now and I'm safe and I'm good. What then do we do to get it to the next level? Cause it's like, okay, I'm good for now, but I don't want to stay here. I don't want to stay in a place of just being okay. I don't want to have to work so hard to protect myself against noisy neighbors, or I don't want to have to work so hard to protect myself to always having to be, you know, counting every dollar. I don't want to have to um, protect so hard or I'm, 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 this is all right for the next 10 years, but then I'm going to be in retirement. What am I going to do then? So our next step, the key to that is gentle discipline, gentle discipline, self-discipline, realizing that the things that you do every day are either reassuring you or freaking you out. Now they might be massively reassuring you or they might be massively freaking you out. Or what's more usual is a little bit reassuring, or a little bit freak out. And sometimes they can be doing both things at the same time. So let's imagine that you're not feeling good. And so you reach for some sugary baked good and you eat that. And in the moment you feel ah oh, reassured, you know, the chemicals are moving differently. You've sent yourself a message that you're not helpless. You can do something. You feel like, oh, I'm here. I'm showing up for me. But then almost immediately is maybe the sugar dip and you're feeling discombobulated, you're feeling not okay because um, suddenly, um, you know, you've, you've, you've got kind of got an ins- insulin spike and then it's crashed. And again, your body isn't feeling safe. So that's an example of how some of the things that we use to reassure us end up hurting us either a little bit down the line or way down the line. So for some people, um, the way that they reassure themselves is they, they say, I, I remember that um, there was somebody who I knew I'd been in high school with and they didn't go to university um, because they said to themselves, um, you know what, I don't want to miss my, I don't want to w- miss this prime part of my, of my life. And they went away and they had a lovely time. They traveled um, and then um, I met up with them again in our early 30s and they said, you know what, I, I kind of wish that I had done something at that time. So something can feel not great um, uh, immediately after, or it can feel not great further along. So what we need to do is we need to have the discipline to know that we can do things, we can choose how we're going to feel not great. There's a big difference between feeling unsafe and feeling not great. And some people have kind of put those things together. And so they're living a life where they're watching TV and they're eating pizza and they're having beer. And this isn't to judge them, right? They, that's as good as they know. And maybe there's people around them who are doing way worse things, right? So all the love to them. But what they've done is they've conflated, they've, they've stuck together in their brain, the feeling of feeling safe in the moment and feeling safe in life, getting themselves to a place of long-term okayness, right? So having it that you are feeling safe and then you choose something that's a little bit difficult. So those of you who uh, work a lot with me, you know that I never suggest something without um, going there first myself. So I said to myself, right, with this principle of, you know, doing difficult things in order to reassure you, what can I do? So yesterday I went in for a handstand workshop and I knew that I was going to be the worst in the class. I was. I knew that it was going to hurt like hell. It did. Um, And I also knew that I was going to be okay. Right. So there was that baseline okayness in doing the difficult thing. So baseline okayness in doing the difficult thing. That is a really great way to think about discipline rather than 
I'm hurting enough, I don't want to hurt anymore, which is the way we often tell that story to ourselves. And it doesn't have to be something huge to start off with, right? I, um, you know, my body's in really good shape because I have a daily discipline. Um, you know, I eat live foods, I don't drink alcohol, I don't, I don't eat sugar, all, all that stuff. Um, and because I've been doing it for so long, oh, by the way, huge, huge part of feeling baseline okay, baseline safe, is to um, get yourself away from the things that are roller coaster foods, things that take you way high and way low, or take you way out of the game, like alcohol, and then you're way in the game, or foods or things like caffeine that takes you like on this way high, um, like you know, false thing, and then it, it comes down. It can't be sustained. So you know, just keeping it a bit more level, um, you know, not. Uh, um, not overdoing it, right? As humans, um, we, we will make, say things like, uh, okay, um, you know, nothing to excess or everything in moderation. Everything in moderation is my least favorite phrase, okay? And I'll tell you why. Because culturally, our understanding of moderation is completely out of whack. It's just gone. What we understand as moderation culturally, our body understands as complete roller coaster freak out time. And we've got to recover from that. Yeah. So, you know, people say, oh, I'll just have um, a little bit of, of this. And then also, you know, if you're around people who their idea of moderation, like I, I know people who think I'm absolutely insane. They think I'm too much. And when they say it to me, they'll be looking, they'll be going, oh, my God, that's too much. I'll be going, thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it's what I need to do in order for me to feel OK with the body that I have. I've got a very gentle, very, very sensitive body. It's very, very easy for me genetically to get out of whack and to feel unsafe. And I spent years, like all through um, my, my, my twenties, my teens and twenties, I would just cry. That was like my default thing would be, you know, trying to self-soothe through crying. Um, also talking about self-soothing, gentle discipline. Um, you guys are doing great, by the way. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm giving you tons and tons and tons of stuff. We're more than halfway through. Um, thank you for staying so strong and thank you. I'm keeping an eye on the, on the questions that are coming in and, and it's actually your questions that are sparking me um, onto uh, the next subject. So, um, uh, so yeah, when we are, um, when we're crying, what we're doing is we're trying to self-soothe, but we're doing it in a way that isn't of a very high standard, right? Um, sometimes it's all we've got. So again, we go there, it's all we got. We have a good cry. We feel better. And then what might be even better? Some people try and self-soothe. We, we talked about a few different ways with disassociation, um, trying to, uh, some people try and self-soothe with something like gambling. Let's use gambling as an example because it's pretty obvious. So let's imagine that you, um, that you feel freaked out about your finances and you say, well, I've only got a hundred quid left in the world, so I might as well put it all on red. I, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I just know that's a gambling phrase. Um, I'm going to put it all on red and I'm going to look that up later. Um, and then you lose it all, right? And, and, and then you say to yourself, well, okay, I tried to self-soothe with that. I tried to self-soothe by taking this crazy big risk. Okay, we ask, what might be a better way? And often it's the more dull things that can be more soothing. Something like going for a walk, right? So those who are recovering from addictions, they are encouraged to do the things like maybe get into an addiction meeting or, you know, go for a walk. Or um, I always encourage people, and I'd encourage you to have this too, always have an SOS box, like a physical box that you say, right, if I ever get so freaked out, this is where I go. And in it, you can have touchstones things that remind you of who you are, things that remind you of times when you um, felt invincible or at least felt safe. Um, it, it could be uh, that you just, you, you have a, a photograph from a time when you were really, really happy. And anytime you look at that photograph, that helps you to bring your body back to that place. Um, also just reminders, very often when we feel unsafe, it's because it's a particular time of day. I don't believe myself, if it's a negative thing, I don't believe myself between eight o'clock at night and six o'clock in the morning when I wake up. I just don't. If I wake up at three o'clock with the thought, I just choose to not believe it. I say, no, 
I don't believe you. You're, you're not the real Judy May, right? The outstanding, phenomenal person that I've built myself out to be. She doesn't exist between eight and six. Why? Because the body is too depleted. The mind is too depleted. There's a great book called Willpower by uh, Bowmeister and Tierney. And, uh, and in it, it's explained how there's this little kind of switch in the brain that is a decision maker switch and how that gets fatigued. It gets fatigued just as the day goes on. It gets fatigued as you don't have, um, you know, good energy on board for lots of different reasons. So by the time it's later in the day, people are making worse and worse decisions. People, you know, arguments happen and then you throw in other things like, um, you know, uh, you know, watching something on TV or watching a movie that's not uplifting and that can add to your feelings of unsafety. By the way, if you have this habit, look at it. Some people try to deal with their unsafety by looking at difficulty. So my dad is one of these, right? He's And he's always done it and I've seen it not working for him, but you know, that that's okay. He does lots of other things really well. And what people will do is they'll want to check in with the news and they feel that at least if they know what's going on, then they can feel safe. And it's a very short term kind of safe because actually you're feeding images to yourself that are um, saying that the world is not a safe place. Most of the world is very safe most of the time. Most of the world is very safe most of the time. And when I was um, doing a postgrad um, degree in, in Trinity College Dublin back in the 90s, I, um, part of what I had to do was I had to read this book that was all, it was about a serial killer and mass murders. Now, while I was immersed in that book, and it was a good month that I had to like do a really, really deep dive on it, how safe do you think I felt? I was jumping at every car door, slamming every person that passed me on the street. So your brain cannot differentiate between, um, well, first of all, between fact and fiction. So if you're feeding it uh, horror movies, it's going to believe that um, the world is horrific. If you're feeding it um, images of um, war scenes, then um, you're going to be less useful to the people who need you because you're feeling like you are in that um, that war zone. And so your body's going to start armoring and then you're going to be like, oh, I'm uptight. Why? And you're going to start scanning your own life and you're going to be finding reasons why. And that reason might be because, um, oh, we've got people joining from Australia now. Hello, hello. Uh, we've got people still joining. Hello. It's all right. It's good. We've still got another uh, 25 minutes to go and we're going to just be giving, I'm going to be giving you everything that you need for the next uh, 20, 25 minutes. So um, as a predictor, you, we're telling our brains all the time, what can we expect? So if we're constantly instigating arguments, then we're telling our brain, expect arguments. If you are constantly um, doing things that make you feel sluggish throughout the day, you're telling your brain you can expect more sluggishness. So how are you training your brain right now? Are you training your brain that you are going to, some of you are really into this um, self-sufficiency thing, that I know what to do and I'm going to do it, right? And th that is something that I had to train myself out of. I, th I always thought that I knew best and then I was getting around people who really were doing so much better than me when it came to feeling great, doing great things. And so um, I, I, I really listened to them. And so what are you listening to? How are you training yourself? So if you're around someone and they, and they say something like, oh yeah, you've got to, you know, liquidate everything and you've got to, um, you know, buy yourself tins of beans and you've got to uh, make sure you've got a bunker and you got it like, you'll, you'll start to, that will become the future that you're heading toward and, and everything that you do, even if it's not consciously, subconsciously and consciously, everything that you do will be leading toward that eventuality. What do you want your future to be? A lot of you are feeling freaked out and not okay right now because you're feeding yourself a story that the future is somehow not going to be ideal. That somehow if you think the future is going to be amazing that you're being naive. No, you're not being naive because you're not just sitting there hoping it's going to show up. You're taking really good informed action. You're getting great coaching. You're going to great events. You are asking yourself great questions. So there's a reason why you know that your future is going to be amazing if you set it up that way. For a lot of people, they ended up dreamless over the last few years. 
they saw that things were changing. Okay, that's, I didn't predict that going that way. I didn't know that was going to go that way. I feel unsafe because I'm scared that this political party is going to get in. I feel unsafe because, you know, my, my parents have dementia. I feel unsafe because, right, there's a whole lot of unsafety, but you, you're taking that unsafety that you've been feeling and you're giving it the meaning. That means that my future is going to be this, or it means I can't predict the future. You can. You, we we predict the future by making it. So every time that you eat something healthy, you can predict that your future is going to be one of health. Every time that you make a really great decision in your business, that you um, get a consultant on board, that you um, change how you're doing things, every time you do that, you are predicting that you're going to have a successful business. So the prediction isn't it doesn't have to be fed to you from the outside world. You can create really great predictions through your daily disciplines, through the actions that you take. So we've talked about presence. We've talked about discipline. Now we're going to talk about the new, right? A lot of people are doing things in a very old way. They have their presumption and they're going to just keep going with that presumption. If something is not working for you, if it's just not ideal, I, I do a thing that I call, I just going to get crazy on it. Just get crazy on it. And often that means doing something that is quite uncomfortable in the moment. So um, I remember, uh, so uh, recent, those of you, of you who follow me on social media, you know that um, recently I hit a thousand days of um, consecutive days of Duolingo learning Russian. Um, but I've actually been learning Russian for a lot longer than that. And um after the first couple of years of doing three minutes a day on YouTube, um, watching all Blue's Clues in Russian and all kinds of things like that um, on YouTube, what happened was I started to believe that it wasn't working. And so the way that we test an idea, if we, if we say this isn't going to work for me, I'm never going to be this, um, I'm this kind of person, it's never going to change, test it radically. Test it by doing something radically new. So um, I remember one time I was uh, writing an academic paper. I, I still do some academic stuff. And I was writing an academic paper. It just wasn't working, wasn't working at all. So I phoned up an academic and I said, um, I want to hire you. I want you to read this paper and tell me why it's not working. It's awful. I don't want you to sugarcoat it for me. I, I know it's awful. I want you to tell me why it's awful. My goodness, best money I ever spent. Like it was just, he, he said, well, you're doing this and you're doing this and you're presuming this and you're presuming that and you're talking down to people here and you're um, getting fuzzy here and you're doing, and it was, my ego did not love it at all, right? So often our ego is a way that we try and get our reassurance, right? I'm superior to these people in this way because, yeah? Um, and in fact, just a side note on that, most people these days, the way that social media is training people is to reassure themselves by inciting envy in others. You know, that if you can, if you can show the world that you are the biggest, the best, the brightest, the shiniest, the thisness right? Um, if, you're, if you are the ultimate in some way, if you can incite envy in others, if you can have other people going, wow, I wish I was them. Wow, I wish I had their life. That, that that is how you get your reassurance. I'm okay because I'm envied is a really, really low level way for us to, to live because it sets us up in competition with the world. And then when we're in competition with the world, rather than um, in like uh, having the world as our, um, our, our co-creators, co-creating with the world, then what happens is we end up feeling even more unsafe. So we've got to make people even more envious. And I coach, many of you know this, I coach a lot of very, very successful people, people who are household names. And this is the loop that they're in. And they're only just realizing it for many of them. Um, or they've only been realizing it for the last year and trying to put in place other ways of reassuring themselves. You would think, if you knew the names of these people, you would think, wow, there's no way they need reassurance. They really, really do because they've got such a low level way of, of, of letting themselves know that you're okay, you matter, you're loved. There's a huge difference between being worshipped and being loved, right? So, it, you know, one, one is understood by the body as, ah, yes, I'm safe. The other one is, oh, I better keep doing these things, otherwise these people are going to go and worship somebody else. So have a look to that. Are you thinking that 
um, you're not safe because you're not inciting enough envy. Good. You're way ahead of a lot of people on this planet um, if you're not using that as your way of reassuring yourself. Um, so, right, um, that was a lot. I think um, we've, we've gone uh, pretty much around the houses. Let's just uh, have a little um, look at then what we can do when we're putting in place the new. A lot of people I find when I'm coaching is they don't, often they don't want to hear the thing that is going to get them to that next level. So let's just imagine that I am co coaching a young singer-songwriter, right? I've helped lots of singer-songwriters to get themselves to the top of the charts over the years. And so, I, you know, I, I really do know what I'm talking about. And I also know how much the industry changes because a lot of my really, really dear friends are at the top of the music industry. And so, you know, they're, they are producers, they are A&R, they are um, executives in um, big um, music companies. Um, they are you know, stars that they are that. So I so I do know. And yet it's very interesting to me that this young singer songwriter will just keep going. No, that's not the way it works. No, that's not the way it works. And I just very calmly sit with them and say, OK, let's do it. You know, let's do it this way. Let's look at it this way. Let's look at it your way first. And let's look at how, yes, you can do that. And let's look at the time it's going to take you. Some people are exhausting themselves, um, you know, creating feature length movies for Instagram, thinking that that's the only way they're going to bring in customs. So they are exhausting themselves by doing all this work to bring in customers. And then they got to do all the work with the customers. If you look on my social media, you see that um, I, I very, very rarely uh, reach out on social media. F most of the things that I do um, are, are just delivering on that. And so a lot of the times people are exhausted, which equals a feeling of not okayness because they're doing way too much. But to bring it back to the original thought that we're having here, and that is that a lot of people are challenging the assumption, sorry, they're, they're challenging the solution rather than the assumption that they have. So my solution might be, you got to move here or you've got to speak to this person or you've got to change this about what you're doing or you've got to change this about your format or you've got to, you know, sometimes it's, it's that direct. I can see what you're doing that is not working. For uh, one young man, it was, you've really got to get yourself um, off the, the, the drink and the drugs. And then, you know, they start quoting to me, Jim Morrison this and, you know, all the greats, Janis Joplin, you know, all died young, all died at 27. Um, and... So the, the thing was, he was pushing back against the solution rather than pushing back against his assumption. His assumption was that um, uh, alcohol and drugs were um, part of making it big in the music industry. It was a wrong assumption. We all have wrong assumptions and our wrong assumptions are our blind spots. And so there's a thing in coaching called blind spot coaching. And very often when we start to put in place somebody's next level, we start to build out their next level of their dream with them. That's what we're doing is blind spot coaching saying, you know, yeah, great. I love that you um, great. Argue with me. I'll always say that to people argue with me. Tell me like it's better that you say it rather than just have it spinning around in your head. And so, you know, what, what is it that you are assuming? What is it that you're presuming right now? What is it you're believing? And then I can say, yes, right, I can see that. So from where you sit, that's what you're believing. And I'm sitting in a different place and that's why you've hired me as your coach. I'm sitting in this different place and I'm able to see all these things that you can't see. But we can't know what we don't know. You know, it's 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 at that level. So, for example, um, uh, a, a singer songwriter in Ireland came to me and he his thing was, I just got to work on my music. I just got to work on my music. It's like, no, your music is fine and you have enough. What you have to work on is um, how you are training the music industry as to who you are, especially as you're starting off a little late. Um, within one year, he went from playing in a bar to being um, long listed for a Grammy. Those of you who know what that means, you know that's a big deal. Long listed for a Grammy isn't like in, in the whole world of musicians. For him to travel that far in that amount of time. And when he came to me, he was freaked out thinking he was never going to make his dream come true, right? So reassure yourself. Say, you know what? I can do new things, right? I can do the new. I can do difficult things. So that is the discipline part. 
right? I can do things and things only remain dif- difficult until we know this, you know, we have great teachers around this, like James Clear, you know, until it just becomes your norm. So for me, people say, oh my gosh, how do you do this every day? How do you learn these languages every day? How do you study for so long every day? How do you work out in this way? How do you not eat this? How do you, um, you know, how do you uh, travel so much? How do you, it's my norm. None of it feels difficult. It all feels delightful and amazing right? Um, I even have people who will sometimes say, you know, is it not, is it not really annoying to you to have to be so happy all the time? And it's just like, no, absolutely not. No, this is my default. This is where I have worked to bring myself to this point. So everything that you want, you can create in the future, but the place that you create it is in the now. And if your now isn't feeling safe, there's not going to be enough of you available to get that traction to get that moving forward. And again, uh, you know, whether you work with me or you work with somebody else or you're doing one-to-one coaching or you're doing um, courses, um, whatever it is that you are doing that's new for you um, or next level for you, realize that, you know, none of us can do this on our own. A lot of us are feeling scared because we weren't designed to do anything on our own. We're feeling that we have got to have all the answers. There's a great book called Who Not How by Dan Sullivan. And in it, it you know, it talks about how um, we're, we're, you know, again, people are trying to become their own like video editor and their own accountant and their own, you know, as well as doing the thing that they really want to be doing. And then they also, you know, are being their own recruiter for staff and they're being their own PA and they're being their own stylist and they're being their own there's a time for that, right? And there's another great book called Range, by the way, by um, David Epstein that talks about the importance of exploring in lots of different realms. But at some point, in order to get that traction, in order to get to that next level, you're going to have to start to partner with great people. And this leads us to, how much time do we have? Yeah, we've got a little bit more time. Hopefully you guys are okay with me going over the 50 minutes, but I really want to just bring home a couple more ideas um, uh, with you because I did promise you that I want to make you feel not just great today, but great long term. So um, so for uh, for a lot of you, a thing that you are, are, are looking to is that you're looking to make things happen. And so you're getting together with people who are at the same level as you are, or maybe just a tiny little step ahead. Right now, you can get around people who are way far along or have already done and gotten tired of and moved on from something that you uh, want to make happen. So right now I've got um, a couple of really good friends. Um, who I've got a lot of my uh, tribe is in LA and um, they in the uh, 90s and uh, uh, up until about five years ago, they they were running their own sitcoms. Like they created and um, you know, produced and hired for, and just, they were, it's called being a showrunner. They were showrunners for some of the major sitcoms that you know about. And now they've just done that. They've done it. And now what they're loving doing is they're loving to um, sit with people and help people not make all the mistakes, not do it the hard way. One of them um, is a woman and she is teaching women how to do it and what to put up, not to put up with and um, how to present yourself, particularly as a woman in a place that is unfortunately still um, very misogynistic, that, that, that whole scene. It's getting way better and needs to get better still. Same thing then for uh, you know, people who, um, you know, it's, it's much harder if you're not white. And so it, it's like, you know, looking at that. And so there's a lot of people who have been where you are now and are really happy to provide that service to you. And you've got to, you got to step up and make that happen in whatever way you need to make it happen. But you've got to stop telling yourself the story that you're stuck. You've got to stop trying to do it all on your own. And the, the way that you're going to be able to start to get this massive momentum and things can happen very, very quickly. And we love that. You know, if you look at some of the, um, you know, the people who are soaring really, really high right now and you think, wow, you know what? They, they, they got there really fast. Well, two things. First of all, they spent a long time training at what they did. You've done that already. You know that you're already expert. And the people who come to me are usually very, very brilliant thinkers, um, experts in their field. Um, and, and you, you may be thinking that, okay, it's taken me 10 years to get here, or it's taken me 30 years to get here. Therefore, you know, oh gosh, it's going to take me another 30 years to get to the next level. No, you can do things a lot, lot faster than you know, when you get rid of those blind spots. So knowing that the future is going to be way better is a massively reassuring thing. 
massively reassuring. But you've got to align with the new, not just as an idea, but as a series of practices, as a series of things that you now start to do very, very differently. In the last year, I've taken up um, ice skating. I've taken up uh, um, flying trapeze because I had this idea that in this lifetime, I was never going to be that woman. You know, I was never going to be... Um, uh, my, you know, my balance was never going to be good. I was never going to be um, that, what's the word I'm looking for, um, you know, elegant on the ice, that I was never going to be, um, you know, physically uh, safe. I was never going to feel that level of confidence. I was never going to be that, you know, very tanned California girl with the roller skates on. I was never going to be her. Immediately I had that idea. I decided, right, I'm going to dive right in. I'm going to do everything that I can everything that I can to show myself that in fact, you know, I can do the next step and the next step and the next step. And you just keep doing it. But your baby steps must be inspired because a lot of people are feeling um, that, yeah, they're doing baby steps because they're so freaked out. So they're doing baby steps in a very protective way. We don't need to protect. We are already are safe. When we know how to set a boundary, we know how to say our quiet no, we know how to hold a boundary. Then what we do is we say, right, what is it that I need to do? And Your life, your future is so much more extraordinary than you've been allowing for. And you get to redesign, you get to regroup, you get to say, right, from where I am now, what is it that I need to do? How do I need to move forward now? Who does my tribe need to be? What are my blind spots? How can I design this? And the reason for that is that you were put here to fulfill something extraordinary, Something that only you can do. You with your background, you with your hurts, you with your triumphs, you with your kind of mind, you with your kind of lifestyle, you with where you are on the planet, you with the exact age that you are. It's all, the the design is perfect. There's nothing wrong with the design. But we've just got to find a way that we can start to ride that, that we can start to be very, very powerful. And the first part of power is to be the eye of the storm, to be the absolute calm, the stillness where we can make excellent decisions, where we can be unafraid so that we can make this dream happen, not just for ourselves, not just for our loved ones, but for everybody. You've got this. We're all in this together. I applaud you for showing up today. Um, reach out if there's anything at all um, that you need to know, any way that I can help you at all. And until the next time, I do these about only twice a year and you've shown up in your hundreds from all over the world. What a great tribe. Just think about today, the things that you're going to do, the ways that you're going to be feeling, how that is going to raise the energy of the planet in a very, very practical way. Things are going to happen today. Things are going to happen tomorrow because you showed up and you decided that you were going to radically change how it is that you're doing life. You're gorgeous. I love you. Huge hugs. And I'll see you very, very soon.